Good to see each of you here tonight. We kind of expected kind of a low crowd, but uh, glad you're here to learn God's Word. It's always good for me, and I know it's good for each of us. We're going to be in First Thessalonians. You know, we're doing a, a kind of a run through of Paul's letters, and, and uh, different people are taking different uh, chapters. I'm going to be doing First Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to start in Acts 17, just to do a real quick overview um, of an introduction. It's going to be an introduction, but it's going to be a really quick introduction. During the uh, Paul's second missionary journey, he went through... Uh, uh, Thessalonica, you know, came up around Macedonia, and to make a long story short, he came up around Macedonia, visiting different areas, uh, Apollonia, I think it's mentioned here, Amphipolis, Apollonia, and then Thessalonica, and then went to Berea, and then he gets, starts going down, and he ends up in Corinth, but he leaves Timothy, or he sends Timothy back, or leaves Timothy there, we'll see that in a minute, minute. so um, let's read... Uh, chapter 17, maybe the first, we'll read up to verse 9, maybe. Now, when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. According to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer, rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a great multitude of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of leading women. So you see there... What seems to have initially made up the church, that being God-fearing Jew, uh, Greek, some Jews, and a number of leading women. But the Jews becoming jealous, verse 5, uh, and taking uh, along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the seed in an uproar, and uh, coming upon the house of, of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. And when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason. And some of the brethren before the city authorities shouting, These men are, have upset the world, have come here also. In other words, they've turned the world upside down. And Jason had welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decree. Uh, and Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And they stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. And, and the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went to the synagogues in Berea. And it talks about the Bereans being more noble-minded than the Thessalonians, uh, those at Thessalonica in verse 11. So this is kind of a, and I guess it was something that was really hard for me to understand. I mean, these few verses we read here is just a quick caption of something that may have happened over a, a reasonable amount of time. It wasn't like a day, I don't think. In other words, he stayed with them uh, for probably a little while. Um, and then going to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I want to, us to notice what Paul says about them because I think it's very important because the chapter we're going to deal with is about some problems they were having. Well, they were having problems, but they were a church of Christ, a church of God that, that also had a lot of good, Paul said a lot of good things about them. So chapter 1, verse 8, it says, For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Now Achaia is where Corinth is. That's where he is writing from. Um, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from the idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven whom He raised from the dead. That is Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. So he says a lot of good things here in the beginning of the letter of First Thessalonians about them. But Timothy again had been sent back uh, to Thessalonica while Paul had come on down to Corinth. And so we see in chapter 3, say verse eight, uh, 6, look what it says. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we have we were comforted about you through your faith, for now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. So as we go through here and we talk about these, these problems uh, that Paul's going to deal with that the church of Thessalonica was having, we need to remember that this was a good church that had a good, some good qualities. Seems like they were very evangelistic. 
Uh, they were well known in the area uh, of their of their faith and and things like that. So, you know, I think uh, sometimes I wonder what Paul would say about Sowell Road, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But the point the point is, we all you know all the churches are made up of human beings. They're in Christ, but we all have difficulties, and so problems can crop up, and they did in Thessalonica. So um, this was probably written probably around AD 50, 51, uh, very early for most of Paul's writings. Um, so let's, let's begin in chapter 4. That's where we want to begin our, our, our study tonight. We're going to read the first couple of verses. He says, finally then, brethren, we, requ- we, re- we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as how you ought to walk and please God just as you actually do walk, that you may excel still more, for you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. A couple of things kind of hit me when I read this. Of course, you know, if you read commentaries, they're going to say finally means a transition to another subject, and that's fine. Uh, and, and, and important when you're doing a deep study. But notice, there are instructions to us who are in the Lord. And you're going to see this time after time after time in this chapter, the word sanctification. And, and I know this is kind of stupid to say, but, but over and over he's going to beg, beg those of us who are in the Lord to remain away from the ways of the world. And I don't know if you have this problem, but daily, I'm sure you and I myself also deal with this problem. The world is tugging at us from all its the TV and sexuality and whatever else you may want to put in the blank that tugs at you. The world is tugging at us. And, and, and these people were having problems. It was all around them, particularly sexual immorality. It was all around them. You know, Paul here is writing from Corinth, sex, sexual immorality all around Corinth. And here it is in, the, in, 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 in this Greek area where a lot of Greeks were, where they had come out of idolatry and come out of that sexual immorality that had to do with their religion at one time. And they were having problems. And the first thing he says, listen, you're in the Lord. You're in Christ. And when you're in Christ, you're different. You don't do that anymore. And so, he talked about instructions that he had given them of how they ought to walk. And so, when I think, I was thinking about, you know, uh, Gary, Sunday was talking about New Year's goals or resolutions. Uh, this kind of breaks down pretty good for us. How are you walking? How's your daily living in Christ? Are you really living a sanctified life? That is, you're you're in the world, but you're not of the world. You know, your 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 life is different, and it's got to be seen as different. We can't be just right in there doing the, the things the way the world does them. Uh, instructions of how you ought to walk and please God, just you actually do walk. So, they, what were they doing? Paul says, "Listen, you're doing pretty good." You're doing pretty good, but you know what? You can do better. And I was thinking about Sawa Road again. I think we're doing pretty good, but can we do better? And I think Paul would would want us to to keep on going, keep doing better. Um, There's a number of times I come across people when I talk to them about the Bible, and they'll say things like, listen, I really don't pay that much attention to most of the Bible. Uh, I'm just a Jesus person. And that is, you know, whatever Jesus said, I'll listen to, but other than that, I'm not that really interested. Well, the Bible doesn't, uh, if we study it, uh, doesn't say those type things. If you go back to John, the Gospel of John, around verse 16, it tells uh, uh, Jesus tells the apostles that, listen, you'll be guided into all truth. And these instructions that Paul gives are just like Christ's instructions. It's very important that we never get into the idea and allow people 
other religions to tell us, listen, y'all don't, y'all don't study, the, study Jesus' gospel very much, or y'all don't study God, Jesus' words very much. Everything that we're reading tonight is Jesus' words. Look over there in chapter 2, verse 13. Look what he says to them. And for this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received from us the word of God's message, you accepted it not as the word of men, but what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its works in those who believe. It also performs its works in those that believe. The word of God given here by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to this apostle is just as binding as anything Christ would say because it's Christ's words. And it has to guide us. It has to show us the Christian walk. So when you or myself talk about I'm walking in Christ or I'm walking daily with Christ, how do I know I'm doing that? I submit to you, if I'm not in God's Word, I can't know that. I can know what other men tell me, Christ says. But as I tell, I love teaching the teenagers, and and I've told them over and over again, you've got to develop your own faith. And some of us adults need to develop our own faith. Because our faith is based on what men have told us and not what God's Word says sometimes. So we need to be very careful to, to study what God has given us here and walk accordingly. So there it is, verse 2, the commandments were given by the Lord Jesus. Verse 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. Consequently, he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So undoubtedly, this is one of those things that Paul had to teach very early on, and they're still having difficulties with it. And so he has to kind of come back and say, you, you've got to abstain from sexual immorality. That verse 4 there is kind of an interesting verse um, in that it talks about that we need to know how uh, to possess our own vessel. Uh, <clears throat> some, some of your translations may say wife there. I don't think it does, but it's probably, from all the commentaries I'm, I'm, I read, it's really probably less favorable talking about the wife there than it is our own bodies. We must know how our bodies can be used in the service of God. How do we make sure that our body is in service to God? And do we think about it? You know, there was a group of people, the Gnostics, which I don't... Gary, I don't know that they were around at this point. They were around later during John's writings, the Gnostics. But I know they had a belief that, or one of their beliefs, depending on which Gnostic you were, was flesh is just terrible and evil, so just do anything with it you want to. And God's Word is very very specific that we've got to use our bodies for His glory so that each of you know how to possess your own body, to use it to honor and honor God and in a sanctified way. That is not like the world. And not in lustful passion. Uh, Turn to uh, Matthew chapter 5. We're going through the life of Christ. And uh, when you come through the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 5, it says something really interesting. And I never have heard it put this way, but Richard was teaching this class. And he said, "How how do we abstain, how do we make sure that we abstain from sexual immorality? 
And one of the things he said is that in the Sermon on the Mount, there seems to be some things that God says that warns us that you need to stop something maybe before sexual immorality begins. And he, and he, and he listed there about in, in, in verse 5 of Thessalonians about lustful passion. But look what verse 37 and uh, I think it's 27 and 28 says in, in chapter 5 of Matthew. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery in her, in her already in his heart. All of our computers and all of our phones, we've got to be careful, don't we? About the things that we see on them and the things that we want to uh, turn to because it leads down the, down the path of lust. And, and, and you may say in your mind, I don't have a problem with that. Well, that's good and fine. But I think we all need to pay attention and do what we can to keep ourselves from getting ourselves into a situation. Males along with females in the business setting or whatever it may be. We just got to be careful. And he, he implores them here to... to to make sure their body is honoring God and not doing like the world says. And verse 6 is very interesting. I, there seems to be a number of times that this particular sin is brought out by Paul. Um, and all I can say is it seems like this sin has more devastation with it and it's recognized by God than probably any other sin that we can mention. He talks about that this sand, if you transgress it, you can't help but defraud your brother. You know, everybody says, well, if I sin, I'm only hurting myself. Well, that's certainly not true with this sin. This sin is devastating to the person that takes part in it. This sin is devastating to those that are hurt by it, whether it be a wife or a husband. So, again, it shows the seriousness, I think, of, of making sure that we're not taking part in this sin. <clears throat> so, again, verse 7, uh, we've been called, we've not been called for impurity, but there's that word of again, but for sanctification. That's two or three times he's used this in this chapter. We're not to act like the world. And then he makes a statement in verse 8, if you... If you reject this and take part in this sin, you're rejecting God who gives the Holy Spirit to you. And some even texts say you're rejecting God and the Holy Spirit, and I think that's certainly the case. Um, 1 John, let's look at 1 John 5, 3. Love the book of 1 John. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. God has just told us we must abstain from, from immorality. What are we going to do? We're either going to accept it and live accordingly and live a sanctified life, or we're going to reject God. And there's no other really way around it. doesn't mean this sin can't be forgiven, but it does mean that a continual Sinful relationship like that is, is a rejection of God and of the Holy Spirit. So the first thing he deals with is um, uh, sexual immorality. Uh, I made a statement there, and I'll just, um, I'll just state it as it's written. It seems like today our answer is to take away the consequences of fornication. You know, instead of abstaining being what the world wants to do, what do they want to do? Get rid of the consequences, kill babies. Or just accept immor sexual immorality as okay. And that's certainly becoming more commonplace. So again, be sanctified, stay away from what the world is doing. I love Hebrews 10.26, and I just want to mention this. If you keep on sinning will, willfully 
after receiving a knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for your sin. A, re a continual rejection of God, the Word says that I think it can harden you so much that it's very difficult to get back into a relationship with God. So again, I hope we take serious this sin because Paul seemed to do it uh, not only here but in Corinth and other places. It's something that in our world that we live in where uh, promiscuity is just so rampant, we have to be very serious about it and stay away from it. Well, it seems like that that wasn't the only problem that, that they had. <clears throat> he goes on <clears throat> to talk about loving the brethren. And I can't help but believe as you read through uh, Acts 17, and you notice that what made up that church was Jews and Greeks and leading women. Well, you're talking about backgrounds that are way different. You're talking about cultural backgrounds that are really different. You're talking about probably having trouble loving one another the way they should. I can only imagine. And so in verse 9 through 12, he says this, Now as to, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, to excel still more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to attend your own business, and work with your hands just as we commanded you. So love of the brethren. Agape love is, is the term that's always seems to be used in situations like this. And it's the kind of love that, that we see Christ uh, doing while He was on earth. Uh, going to the cross for our sins. He did what we needed. He didn't need it. He did what we needed. And again, just going through the life of Christ, I came across this verse which everybody is uh, really aware of. It's back in the Sermon on the Mount again. But look at it with me. Matthew 7. I think this describes probably what this love is like. Matthew 7, 12 says this, Therefore, however you want people to treat you, treat you treat them, for this is the law and the prophets. Everything about the law and the prophets, if you put into a capsule, is this golden rule. And you notice he says do. It's a verb. It's, it's it demands action. Do unto others. Do unto others. What is love? What is this kind of love? I know what I really want. When, when I mess up and I sin, what I really want is a brother and sister to come to me and help me. Sometimes that doesn't look real pretty. This agape love is not... Always hugs and kisses. Sometimes it's crying with. Sometimes it's uh, exhorting. That's what it looks like. I want you to go to heaven. And so if you're in sin, the best thing I can do is come to you and help you and exhort you to do better. You're, you're to do the same for me. And so I don't know what their problem was with each other, but I can imagine the cultural differences that they were having. And they didn't have this type of agape love that, that Paul knew they needed to have. And notice in verse 9, again, who, who taught them this? God, through His Word, through the apostles' uh, doctrine, had taught them this. And then verse 10, again, that you see this, this is the second time. He says, listen... You're doing pretty good, but then what does he say? You can do better. You can do better. New Year's resolution. We can do better. We can do better. And he says to, to excel still the more, verse 10. And then he describes some of the things that, that obviously were going on here. And I don't know if this is a 
a total list of, 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 of them not showing love, but I think it's an interesting list. It, it wouldn't be a list that I would think of if I, were not, if I was thinking about a congregation that was not showing love. I'm not sure these would be the things that I would pick out. Uh, but they were having problems with this. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, a peaceful life, a restrained life. Am I one that causes problems all, all the time? Am I one that causes arguments and factions all the time? Or am I a peacemaker? And then he says, we ought to all like this, attend to your own business. Attend to your own business. Don't be a busybody. Don't get in everybody's business. All of us have problems of our own that we need to deal with. God's Word is very explicit about when we have problems with one another. I don't go to Owen to talk about Gary and problems that I may have with Gary. I'm going to go to Gary. We can't be busybodies if we'll just follow His Word. Because we're going to go to the person that we have a problem with. Hey, I've heard this. I want to help you. I want to help us all be what we need to be. Whatever the problem may be. And probably one of the most interesting things he says there that, that showed a lack of love for the church at Thessalonica, he says, you need to learn to work with your own hands. That's kind of weird, isn't it? But as Gary has said a number of times, God has always expected His people to work. Always. And I've got it on your sheet there, we are not to be moochers. That doesn't mean that sometimes we don't need help and have problems. And I tell you, one of the hardest things to deal with is a church member that will not work, but feels like they're owed something. It's absolutely not the case. Look what Ephesians 4.28 says. And Gary, you can get to me later. I may be reading this wrong or maybe taking it out of context a little bit. Not out of context, but making a, an application that may not be there. Ephesians 4.28 says, Let him who steals, steal no longer, but rather let him labor, performing with his own hands what is good in order that he may have something to share with him who has need. What am I doing when I'm not working? And I'm not providing for myself, and I'm just mooching off of everybody. What am I doing? Are we stealing? I wonder. I wonder if that's what Paul had in mind. Stop stealing. Go to work. That's what Christians are to be. And if I'm to show the love that I'm supposed to have, I'm, I'm going to be a peacemaker. I'm not going to be a busybody, and I'm going to go to work. Why am I going to go to work? Because I can help others, and I can help my family, as God wants me to. And then he sums it all up in verse 12. Look what he says. So that, I'm going to do the, all these things. I'm going to be a peacemaker, and I'm going to work with my own hands, so that you may behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. You'll have to ask yourself the question, and I should ask myself the question, what do people think about me? What do my actions show people? Am I really any different than those around me? Or So we need to make sure that we show our love toward one another in all aspects. That agape love. Put myself behind your needs and I'm taking care of your needs. And put your needs again ahead of mine uh, to show the love that I have for you.
And then he begins the last section in, in chapter 13, 13 uh, through 18. The second coming of Christ was something that, and I failed to mention this earlier, but something that probably, and I think uh, this is correct, Gary, I think every chapter you find in First and Second Thessalonians is either alluded to or talked about to a large degree, as in this chapter. So there's no question that they had a problem with the idea of the second coming. And so he gives us some facts here that I think are very important, interesting. So it starts in verse 13, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. A couple of things. Paul's words, Christ's words, are made to inform us about what the truth is. Sanctify them truth, thy word is truth. So over and over again, there's an implication. We've got to get in the Word. We've got to stay in the Word. We don't want you to be informed, brother, about those who are asleep, those who have, are dead, that have died. That's the term that's used there. And there's an implication ma made here that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Where are you in your Christian life tonight? Do you, do you still have hope? Well, if you do, then how do we act toward those who have died? Brothers and sisters in Christ. Do we act like and do we grieve as if there's no hope? And it's very difficult for me because I'm a very emotional person. So... It doesn't mean don't grieve. But listen, there's got to be a realization from the Christian that there, there really is something better. The sad part about this is that those people that really have no hope act like they have hope. You've been to funerals where you know good and well they're heathens and all they do is talk about being in heaven. I'm talking about very non-religious people. I'm not even talking about whether they remember the church or not. I'm talking about downright heathens. It is not true. They really don't have hope. But we really do have hope. And so let's don't grieve like those that have no hope. We need to be showing the world that there really is something after this life. And he wants them to know that in verse 13. And we can know that how. Look at the very first, of, uh, first part of verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. How do you know? How do you know there's going to be a resurrection? How do you know you uh, of the hope of the resurrection? Well, I know it because Jesus did it. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. That's how I know. I'm going to go ahead and look at 1 Corinthians 15 because I love the way Paul puts it there. Let's look over there together. Look at verse starting in verse 13. This is chapter 15, verse 13. Look at how Paul puts it to the, to the brethren at Corinth. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we witnessed against God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And we have hoped in Christ... In this life only, we are all of men to be pitied. Christ Jesus was resurrected. And boy, if He wasn't, what a terrible situation we are in. And we are the most to be pitied. But He has been. And He is the first fruits of the resurrection. And because of that, these brethren at Thessalonica could know that there's going to be a resurrection. 
But they still had a problem. They wonder, what, what's going to happen to my parent that's perished? Are they going to be able to take part in the blessings of Christ when he comes back the second time? And so he deals with that. Verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise, rise first. So what a, I, I could just imagine with them thinking, I don't know what's going to happen to my loved one. If Christ comes back, are they going to receive the blessings? He says, listen, not only are they going to, re- not only are they going to receive the blessings, they're actually going to rise first to meet the Lord in the air. What a beautiful, beautiful section here. So it says, the Lord will descend from heaven. There's nowhere that talks about Him coming to the earth again, but He's going to be in the air. We're going to meet Him in the air. It's going to be, there's going to be a shout or a cry of command. It's going to be audible. We're going to hear it. And then it says, the voice of an archangel uh, will be, will sound. Look at Matthew 13, and I just wonder about this. This was in the commentary, and I read it, and I said, that's very interesting. What part are the angels going to take in the resurrection? Look at Matthew 13. This is the parable of the tares. And remember that in this parable, there were tares that were sown with the wheat, and they couldn't tell the difference. And the question was asked, should I go tear the the tares out of the field? And he says, no, just leave them until the end comes. And that's what he says, uh, verse 39, And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Therefore, just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so it shall be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and all those who commit lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire in that place where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. It's an interesting question what part the angels may be having. It says here the angels are going to be the ones that are going to take the tares, that is, the unbelievers, and cast them into, uh, into hell. So, interesting. I don't know if that's uh, just uh, part of the parable there, you know, that's parabolic, but I, I would think not. So, back to 1 Thessalonians. He will descend from heaven with a shout. It's going to be audible, as we said. The voice of an archangel is going to be heard. The trumpet of the God is going to be heard. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, thus we will always be with the Lord. So it's going to be audible. It's going to be visible. Now what's going to happen? What's going to happen after Christ comes and the resurrection occurs? What's going to happen to the earth? It's going to be burned up. So the very idea that there may be some that believe there's going to be a rejuvenated earth or whatever that people are going to come back to and the Old Testament system is going to be set back up and there's going to be a thousand year reign. There's nothing in God's Word that teaches that. So this, this is a very comforting passage for those of Thessalonica. And it should be for us too. Look what he says in verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. New Year's, New Year's resolution. How are you walking? Are you walking in the light? Are you living a sanctified life? Do people recognize you as being different from those people in the world? Secondly, when dealing with my brethren, what kind of person am I? Am I showing the love that I need to be showing? 
These are all things that we can work toward next year. I'm going to walk every day in the paths that God has shown me through His Word. I'm going to show love for the brethren. And I'm going to live in such a way that when the end comes, that I'm going to be one of those that's going to meet the Lord in the air. These are the things that we can learn from chapter 4 and apply to our lives. And they should comfort us. Because as he says in verse 13, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be one of those that has no hope. I want my hope to be real. And I want to be prepared for it. And so daily we've got to be prepared to meet the Lord. Let's have a closing prayer and then we'll have our Devo. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for this letter, Father. We're thankful for words from your Holy Spirit that that guide us and help us to live the way that we're to live, Father. So we ask that you would help us to search your word daily, Father, to make sure that we're walking in the light. And Father, we do ask that you would help us as brethren of this church to love one another and to have the kind of love that you had for us. And Father, we're most thankful for the hope that we have of heaven. And Father, our prayer is that we will be ready and prepared every day because we don't know when you're coming back, Father. But we know when you do come back that we will know it. And so we look forward to that day, Father. Continue to be with us and help us serve you and glorify you with our bodies every day of our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.